Hey guys, JV here from Alpha Wolf Consulting. Alrighty, going through the workshop activities. This is the first activity, which is understanding language patterns. <coughs> All right, so we've got to understand the importance of language, okay, and how language influences our thought patterns, okay? So for example, you know, our language is vital to how we think about a situation. So if I'm in a situation where, you know, the external environment is going against me and I use language like, why is this happening to me? What is, you know, this is taking away from me. If my language is rooted around something happening to me rather than just something happening and I'm enduring it, experiencing it, going through it, okay? What I do is I give that situation, that event or whatever, my power because that event, situation or experience is in, in direct control of how, how I'm feeling. Okay, so an important thing to understand is, is how much our language influences our beliefs. Okay, because if my language is, you know, this situation's bad, you know, it's not going the way I, I wanted it to go, you know, how can I fix this opposed to, you know, this situation is against me, you know, this situation is, is going against me, I'm losing. So what we got to do is we got to understand the negative language patterns that we create in our mind and we got to artificially switch them out. So the way I put this is there's two types of language, subjective and objective, okay? So subjective is where I am the center of that language. Objective is where I am detached from that situation, where I'm observing it, okay? So one is I observe it from being in the middle of it. The other is I'm observing it from the sidelines. And, it, and it's very important because <clears throat> if we don't take control of our, our narrative in our mind, Okay, and we just we just let ourselves subconsciously create narratives. What happens is we feel like everything's going against us. For example, you know, if I'm driving down the street and I get a flat tire and I'm late to work now, you know, why did I have to get a flat tire? You know, it's making me late. I'm going to, you know, potentially lose my job. I'm going to lose time out on work or whatever the narrative is we create based on that, okay, is where we're looking at it from the perspective of something is happening to me. I am the subject of this narrative and everything's happening to me. Whereas if we shift that from, you know, I got a flat tire, you know, these things happen, it's okay that it happened, you know, it's not the best for me in terms of now I've got to go and change that tire and I'm going to lose time, but that's okay. You know, one, one of them, when we're looking at it from an objective viewpoint, it's that the flat tire was always going to happen at some point. This just happens to be that point. So we're just experiencing it now. So we're able to detach ourselves from the situation. You know, if I if I lose my job because of a flat tire and I'm an hour late to work, that's okay. Because what that means is if I was ever one hour late for work, I'm losing my job. Do you understand? Like it's not right for me. So so we've got to understand that our, our narrative shapes how how our subconscious beliefs or how our beliefs are formed. <clears throat> and our beliefs are formed just through the habitual thought patterns that we have, okay? So the more I think about the same thing again and again and again, the more it becomes ingrained as a belief. When it's ingrained as a belief, it now affects my emotional state, okay? Because if I believe that, you know, things happen to me and things are negative, what happens is subconsciously, I'm going to start to create those negative emotions, stress, anxiety, you know, fear, you know, 
you know, I'm going to be late. What are they going to say? All of that. <clears throat> so what we got to understand is we've got to understand how do we change our language? So what we want to do is we want to pull ourselves as the subject of our narrative to being the observer of our narrative. Okay. And how do we do that? We do that through our language of instead of saying, why did this happen to me? Why did this happen? W was there screws on the road that I drove over that caused it? Were my tires balding? You know, was there damage to my tires? You know, was the road unrough? Was I driving unsafely? You know, hitting things at speed? You know, was there was there any obstacle that I hit that caused it? Like, what was the root cause of this situation happening? Because when we have that objective thought process or that objective narrative, what we're able to do is we're able to look at this situation unbiasedly. If this flat tire happened to me and, and it's and it's happening because I'm stressed and this and that, okay, how can I how can I look at it objectively? I can't when I'm the center of the narrative. Because when I'm the center of the narrative, okay, it's very hard for me to look objectively because everything's happening to me. So I have an instant bias of, no, I don't believe that I was driving un, um, recklessly or I don't believe that I was driving unsafely. I don't believe I hit anything. I'm a good driver, you know. I don't believe that, you know, I, I would draw, I would not take care of my tires on my car and all of that, you know. So we want to shift that narrative. And the way we shift that narrative is, is shifting it from I statements to how statements. How did this happen? How can I fix it? Instead of, you know, I have to fix this and, and, and things like that. Like if we can shift our narrative, but we can also shift it from think thoughts of positivity. Okay, so thoughts of negativity to thoughts of positivity. So maybe, you know, I needed some time to myself to change the tire. Maybe, you know, there was an accident prone to happen and me getting this flat tire stopped me from being in that situation. Many, many different things. So when we understand our language and the influence it has, but the importance on how we construct our language, okay? So trying to construct it into an objective view opposed to a subjective view is the first step. The second step is identifying when we want to give blame to other things and, and we want to shift giving blame to taking responsibility. So, so full responsibility is what we have to do because when I am responsible for everything that happens to me, I am in power of everything happening to me. If I don't want to get a flat tire in the future, I can check my tires before I get in the car every morning before I go to work. I can, I can do additional maintenance. I can, I can consciously alter the way I drive to avoid obstacles rather than hit obstacles, okay? So, so that's one of the keys, but then, then we have to shift out that, that negativity. Every time we want to blame other people, okay, we want to blame situations, this happened to me, that happened to me, why did this have to happen? And we just take responsibility for it. But also we have to have an understanding that sometimes situations are just happening. And we just happen to be in the right time and the right place to experience them. So what we need to do is take a deep breath, okay, center ourselves and start analyzing the narrative being put together subconsciously. And we have to manually alter our language. So when you feel yourself going, oh, this person did this to me, we change it to, why is this person doing this? You know, how can I change the situation for my best interest? Because it's hard to get, you know, to be able to see the best outcome when we're stuck in the middle of the situation. We have to take a step back so that we can see the full picture, see the bigger picture, okay? So we've got to be able to do that in our narrative is be able to take a step back from our narrative and look at the big picture of, 
how is this language influencing my beliefs? Because if my beliefs are always that things are happening to me, I have no power to control them because the only way I can control them is by taking me out of the situation. So if I always believe that, you know, every flat tire I get is happening to me, well, the only way I can stop getting flat tires is if I cease to drive or if I buy bulletproof tires. It doesn't, it doesn't really work. So, so what we got to understand is, is the importance of our conscious thought on the construction of our beliefs because our, our thoughts shape our reality. So if everything's happening to us, our reality is that everything happens to us, okay? Whereas if we can shift it from, you know, things are just happening and, and, and why are they happening, okay? So, so if we shift our narr narrative from, you know, this is happening to me to why is this happening to me? What, what am I meant to learn in this situation? Maybe I'm meant to learn to do greater maintenance on my vehicle. Maybe I'm meant to learn to have better time management and, you know, leave earlier. Like, like how can I implement actionable steps to be able to change the situation so that I'm always prepared? Maybe, maybe I can, you know, leave half an hour early in case of getting a flat tire. Maybe I can leave an hour earlier. Maybe I can do a 15 minute spot check on my car every morning. So, so we have a multitude of options that we can take that are within our control. Whereas if it's happening to us, the only thing we can do is we can take ourselves out of the situation. Okay. So it's, it's very important. Because, you know, as I've mentioned, our thoughts shape our beliefs. Our beliefs shape our emotional states. Our emotional states shape our feelings. And our feelings shape our biochemical responses. So if we're always, you know, in a negative mind space with negative thoughts, if we're always blaming others, our belief is that we are powerless. So our emotional state in those situations is one of disempowerment where we have no control. Disempowerment equals fear. Disempowerment equals stress, anxiety, okay? Lack of control, loss of control. And the, and the feelings that we get from that, you know, is the feeling of being out of control. The feeling of being stressed, anxious, in fear of, is this going to happen to me again? When is it going to happen to me? Okay. And the biochemical responses, well, we're, if we're in fear-based responses and we feel out of control, we feel powerless. Okay. So our biochemical responses will be those of high stress. Our stress hormones will be released. And what that does to your body is it restricts all the blood from in, in, your, in your core, which is where everything is, to your extremities. And you get that fight or flight response. You get defensiveness. You become agitated. You know, you, you let it get in there and it ruins your day. So we want to take control over the narrative because the narrative is the base level. When we control the narrative, we're able to control every other aspect of our life, okay? It's a great gift when we understand that because it gives us the power to take control back regardless of the situation. You know what I mean? Because sometimes in life, situations are just going to happen, okay? And sometimes in life, in those situations, we're just going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time or the right place at the right time because all these negative situations are just opportunities for growth, opportunities for us to train our mind, to train our mindset, to take action against what we don't want in our life. And if we want to be happy, if we want to feel secured, if we want to feel in control, okay, we got to understand 
how language and language patterns are the first step. That narrative is the key. The narrative is the ground floor because the narrative is created in our conscious mind, not our subconscious mind. The only time the narrative is created in our subconscious mind is when we consciously don't think about it, when we don't take control, when we blame other people, the narrative is created for us. Okay. And then we use our conscious mind to exacerbate that narrative, to amplify it. Whereas we can use our conscious mind to create our own narrative that we choose to be true and to use it in the same aspect to, to amplify that, that, that mindset, that narrative. Okay. And what we're also able to do is we're able to understand that our beliefs are just habitual thought patterns. So our beliefs are just thought patterns that we have over and over and over and over again that become our truths, okay? Our truths of what are, what is, what could be, okay? Our emotional states are just a representation of our conscious thought and our conscious belief or our subconscious thought and our subconscious belief. Okay, when we're in the subconscious, we don't have control because we only control the conscious side of our mind. Our subconscious mind is controlled by our subconscious because, you know, you're not actively, you know, beating your heart. I'm not actively beating my heart. My subconscious is doing that independent of my conscious thought which means I don't have control over it. Now, I'll grant you this. With enough focused attention, you can stop your heartbeat. With, an, with a strong enough belief that your heart is going to stop, it will stop. There's some crazy studies. I haven't verified them. But back in the 18, 1900s and things like that, when science was state taking off, there were studies done in this, and it's there's some pretty unethical practices that were done. But in essence, what they found was if you believe that you were dying, you will kill yourself because that's how strong your belief is. Just like if you look at survival, you know, scenarios or survival stories from some great people who have survived tremendous hardships. Okay, one of the greatest one is um, the Navy SEAL from Lone Survivor, that, that movie based on the Navy SEAL, who, you know, in, in every sense of the word should have been dead, but he kept pushing on. He kept surviving and believing. And you can see this in many other survival situations where people are lost in the wilderness or where people, you know, you know, there's that movie, 135 Hours or something like that, where he had to cut his own arm off, okay? Now, to do that is insane, you know what I mean? But he had a belief that if he did it, he would survive, and he had the willingness to fight through and survive. Because at any moment in time, you think about it, if your arm was cut off, that's a life-threatening injury. You know what I mean? Because your body goes into shock without the right kind of drugs, without the right kind of, you know, medicine and things like that. Your body can shut down and does start to shut down in shock, right? But also there's other elements, no water for days on end. No, you know, hypothermia. He was in the middle of the desert. The desert gets down, you know, to almost minus temperatures at night. So you got to understand, like, there are many situations where people's belief that they could endure and get through was the reason that they survived, okay? So we'll jump down to the activities. <clears throat> All right. So activity one 
Okay, what I want you to do is think back to a situation that caused you to become emotionally unstable, you know, like a situation that caused you to become stuck in your subconscious, your emotional states, to where you found it hard to consciously react in that situation. So maybe it's a situation where someone did or said something to you that caused you to become fearful, to become upset, to become angry, to become, you know, um, any, any sense of the word unstable or emotionally unstable. So basically what emotion, emotional, uh, emotional instability is, is, is where instead, where right now I'm talking to you from my conscious mind. If someone does or says something to me that makes me become highly angry or triggers me into becoming, you know, in a high state of fear, my conscious brain switches off and my subconscious brain switches on because my subconscious brain is where my survival mechanisms are. So fear, aggression, all of that comes from your subconscious. Okay. So the reason for this is, you know, it's it's in our primal brains or our, our reptilian brains or our our um, survival mechanisms, right? But also emotional instability is where our emotions take control, where our focus goes from being on what we're consciously thinking about to it becomes unstable or unstable, and we and we fall into our emotions. Okay, to where we cannot logically control ourselves, where we say and do things that we have no control over. So think back to an argument or a debate where you were debating with someone and they were saying things that caused you to get triggered. And then you become more and more irrational and you get angrier and angrier and you start becoming defensive and you start arguing your point. Okay. And, and think back to, you know, how could you have changed your language, okay, from subjective to objective to, to being able to disassociate yourself from those emotional responses and sort of see things from a higher perspective or take a step back and see the full picture, okay? Um, and, and it's a good practice because this is one of the first practices in self-awareness and mindfulness. Because what we want to do is we want to train our conscious brain or our subconscious brain, okay, both of them at the same time if we want. But what we want to do is every time we feel ourselves becoming emotionally unstable, our conscious brain has a program that overrides it and says disengage, like drop, drop the emotion. <clears throat> it's the same we can do it with our ego. Okay, so this process works for our ego as well because our ego is I, subjective. So, so what we want to understand is every time we get drawn in as the subject of this state change, we want to shift it to being objective about why is this state changing in me? Why am I becoming emotional? Why am I becoming unstable? Because if we have that control, we're able to cease that, that behavior or that activity that's causing us and we're able to shut down, okay, because that's the first step is to be able to shut down. And then what we want to do is we want to work it and train ourselves, train our mind, so that we're able to, in the moment, realize that we're becoming emotional, okay, or realize that we're becoming emotionally unstable and we want to shut down in a millisecond and then we want to re-go back up in our conscious brain in full control with an objective view of why is this person doing this? What are they trying to gain from me? How could they be trying to influence me? How could they be trying to, you know, lead me to do something that I don't want to do? Or how are they triggering me? Okay, and we do it for people, conversations, debates, 
situations because when my when we're in a situation right a high stress situation it's very easy for the fear to take over so what we have to do is we have to assign that i'm in a high stress situation okay take away the subjective from me being in that situation to now I'm objective. Okay, why am I feeling so stressed? What is causing me to feel stressed? And then we're able to work through that. <clears throat> so it's a very good little practice that you're able to do where, sorry, where we're able to start training self-awareness and mindfulness. And it's the building blocks to us being able to take control of who we are in every moment and choose our narratives, okay? Because when we can choose our narrative of we're, we're in an argument and this person is just triggering me or this person is um, like gaslighting me, right? And they're just trying to get a reaction to our narrative goes from being subconscious to you know, this person's gaslighting me. Why, like, like, you know, how dare they? You know, I'll show them, you know, you want to mess with me, let's go. And we're able to move over to being more objective to identifying this person's trying to gaslight me. How do I minimize my responses so that I can disengage from that kind of behavior? Because if someone's trying to gaslight you and you shut down and you stop responding or reacting, it takes away their power to be able to do that. Now, how I know this is because with my ADHD, when I was younger, I used to love gaslighting people. I used to love taking the um, opposing viewpoint just to argue with people. I thought it was fun. You know, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed arguing, not arguing, but I enjoyed debating. But but when I was younger, okay, I didn't understand the difference between debating and arguing. So what I always tried to do was I would try and make people emotionally unstable because once they became emotionally unstable, they became illogical with their arguments. So I was able to work around them and make them look like a fool. Now, I am not condoning that behavior, but what I'm trying to demonstrate is, okay, people out there do try and do this, and it's an ego-based response. Because if I want to feel superior to you, if I can make you struggle to coherently argue your case or present your point of view, Okay, what I'm able to do is I'm able to control you because all I have to do is, is drop a trigger, get you in stable, unstable, and then I create a very, very coherent and logical argument. And then when you try to respond, I trigger you again and you become even more unstable. And then I drop an even lo uh, another logical argument. And then you try and respond and all I have to do is point out your illogical arguments you've had previously and how irrelevant your current argument is, okay? Now, I used to do that out of my subconscious without understanding, you know, what it was and what it was doing. But also for me, it was because I understood psychology i understood behavioral science in in the sense of i understood that if i can make you emotionally unstable okay i can control you in in an in any argument or debate and a big thing to remember is look at politics this is how they operate look at look at any debating this is how they operate because they don't present factual evidence-based arguments okay so for example you know take jordan peterson okay his arguments that he makes are very very coherent concise and, and they're, they're led with data 
and logic, okay? And you and you see people try and argue against him, and he points out how illogical their case is based on, you know, his presentation of data, his presentation presentation of his logical argument. Okay, and and it makes them look like a buffoon because they're just putting out opinion. You know what I mean? They're not able to structure it as highly. They're not prepared. So this is how, you know, Jordan Peterson is amazing and he talks and he has a wealth of knowledge that he speaks from, okay, and a lot of clinical studies and a lot of academic research. But the people who come up against him try and use pseudoscience and pseudoscience arguments against him. And he's able to pick them apart with logic and reason. And you can see as he picks them apart, they become more and more illogical because they try and entrench themselves in their, in their argument. But their argument isn't based in logic or reason. Their argument is based in pseudoscience. So what happens is then they start trying to attack him because they become emotionally unstable. So they become defensive, aggressive, okay? And, and it's a very, very, like, it's a very powerful thing because it allows you, if you remain in control, okay? Even if, if you, like, for example, in any argument, if someone presented logical, you know, base data, of you know clinical research academic study and all of that okay and they presented that to you which destroyed your position in an argument as a logical person wouldn't you shift your argument like wouldn't you shift your perspective and say well now that you've shown me you know infallible evidence that my argument was wrong i should agree with you because that's that's what naturally should happen but what what actually happens is people become defensive emotional and then they try and argue their point so we've got to understand this and the power of language because when we lose the control over our narrative okay and when we and when we lose control over our ability to logically create our narrative and assess the data that's being presented we lose the argument immediately because, because all we can do is argue from, you know, illogical stance points or, or from very poor defensive positions, okay? <clears throat> so activity two, in that same situation, okay, think of, think of three ways you could detach your emotions from the, situa the situation's outcome, okay? And write down how you rephrase the narrative in your mind. So what we want to do is this above situation that caused us to become emotionally un un unstable, okay? We want to work out three ways that we could shut down and detach from that. So for example, one way is if we feel our ego being triggered, well, we can we can stop that. So when when we feel like we're being insulted, that's our ego. When we feel like we're we're stupid, that's our ego, because our ego is all of that, you know, egotistical BS that we hold. You know, it's that narcissism. It's all of that self importance So when we're able to detach, we're then able to look at things clearly again because our emotional state will cloud our judgment okay and what we want to do is we want to think about how did we how did we shift that narrative and we want to write that down and that way we, we can start to look at the language like the key language that we use to to restructure or reshape our narrative to help us one detach, but also to help us regain control. So it's a very good practice to do. Um, and it's just it's just a, a more advanced step of mindfulness and awareness. Because now in every situation, we're aware 
that there is language that we can use now that can get us out of those states, that it's it's our narrative that's creating those emotional states that is creating us to become emotionally unstable. And we're able to then go out and over time, the more you do this, okay, just like the more I do this, the more control we get because we're able to store those language patterns and remember them. So then we're able to understand the language we should use to rephrase the narrative in our mind, okay? And it's a, it's a very powerful thing because the as I mentioned, you know, with the brain and with, you know, your synaptic pathways, the more we, we practice and we rehearse these language patterns, the quicker our brain will be, our, our thought pattern will be able to reach them. So the quicker we'll be able to get that information because our synaptic brain paths or pathways or whatever it's called will basically become stronger or thicker, okay? Which means it's quicker for data to go back and forth, okay? And what that allows us to do is that allows us to, one, think quicker, react quicker, but also it allows us to remember things quicker so that we have that mental liquidity of being highly adaptable to different situations, especially when it's linguistic situations, when it has to do with language or when it has to do with situations and dealing with situations. <clears throat> All righty. So activity three. All right. We want to use a subjective narrative and an objective narrative in this situation that we're, that we're going through. And we want to note down our emotional states. So we want to run through first the subject, subjective narrative and we want, to, we want to measure what are the different emotional states that we're feeling because of that narrative. And then we want to do the objective to that exact same situation. So we want to create an objective narrative that, that we've created in the above. And what we want to do is we want to note down our emotional states. This way we have conscious knowledge of the of the emotions that each of these narratives gives us so that we're able to self-identify okay this emotional state is coming from this narrative okay so that every time i feel a certain emotion i know i'm either in an objective narrative in my mind or an objective state of mind or i'm in a subjective narrative or a subjective state of mind okay so it's a really good practice this is the more advanced one this is how we can self-identify at a rapid rate the different emotional states and what's causing it because then we're able to go back through and we're able to look at the narrative look at the language look at the situation and say, okay, I'm feeling anxious because maybe in it, you know, or maybe it's that I feel fear. Okay. So people's, you know, arguments and things like that make me feel fear and, and, and their behaviors or their actions towards me or the language I use causes me fear. So think about fear is not just being physical. <clears throat> There's mental fear fear of being stupid, fear of, you know, sounding stupid, saying something stupid. There's emotional fear, fear of loss, fear of abandonment, fear of rejection. So that every time we feel that that fear of rejection, we're able to identify that's, that's the fear of rejection. Okay, what in my narrative or what in the situation is causing that from me? Okay. And then we're able to go through and once we identify that, hey, it's the language that this person's using, we're then able to ask ourselves, why is that person using that language? Like, what's their end goal? Like, maybe they're just in a reactive state and they're just trying to hurt us because, you know, what we've said's hurt them. Like most arguments between couples, <clears throat> where it becomes that toxic back and forth of you say this, well, I say that. Oh, you said that? Well, I'm going to say this, okay? So what we also got to do is ask ourselves, well, 
how did the subjective narrative with you as a sub subject make you feel? And then we want to look at how did the objective narrative with, with the situation as the objective make you feel? And we want to go through <clears throat> and we really want to understand, well, you know, if if the situation, if 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 I'm in a situation where where someone's telling me, you know, I'm going to leave you if you don't do this, this, and this, I'm going to leave you, I'll find someone better than you. Okay, and I'm in a subjective state of mind or the subject of the narrative. Okay, what am I going to feel? I'm going to feel rejection. Whereas if I'm in the objective narrative or an objective state of mind, I can look at and go, well, why would you be threatening me? Is it that, you know, these are red flags and this relationship isn't actually right? Are we not meant to be together? And we're able to get that power back because we're able to analyze it and we're able to look at it. Because one way is that we feel like we're being attacked. The other way is we're trying to understand why is this attack coming at me? You know, what's causing this? And we're able to discern through it. All right. So, <clears throat> um, you know, you should start to see a bit of a difference of, you know, when we're in a subjective or, or when we're subject to a negative situation, we feel trapped by the outcome. And when we're like, and when we when the situation is the object, so so when we are the subject of a negative situation, we feel disempowered and trapped by that situation or by the outcome. I'm going to leave you if you don't do this, this, and this. When someone says that to me and I am the subject, okay, then I'm thinking, oh, I don't want that outcome. I have to do something. I have to do this or I have to do that. I have to make it right. Whereas when I'm in the objective, like, like when I'm looking at the situation objectively, <clears throat> okay, and someone says, I'm going to leave you, I can say, well, why? Do you not want to be with me? Like I'm able to see, like detach from the outcome and say, well, you know, I don't want this to end or maybe I do want this to end. But if I didn't and it's an, like a minor argument and they're threatening to break up with you over that, you're able to say, well, why would you want to break up over such a small thing? Does that mean I shouldn't trust you in the future? Does that mean at the slightest drop of a hat, you're going to just go off and leave me? So, so we're able to detach from it, okay? And we become powerful when we do that because we have control. We have the power to change whatever we want to change. We have the power to have the conversation that we want to have. All right. Well, that is activity one, understanding the language patterns and really understanding the difference between being the subject of the narrative and objectively looking at the situation and using our narrative. All right. Well, you have a great day, and I'll talk to you later. Okay, bye.